a very warm welcome to all our participants who join this live telecast from across India and the neighboring countries on the Facebook, YouTube and LinkedIn channels. They are predominantly young professionals, policy analysts, journalists, academicians and responsible citizens. We are very blessed to have an extremely distinguished panel comprising of a retired chief election commissioner, distinguished economists, thought leaders in public policy, heads of famous think tanks, prolific writers and an investigating journalist. My humble greetings to this distinguished panel. I acknowledge our online media partner, Lawyered. Lawyered advances the rule of law by enabling lawyers to connect and cooperate across borders. Thank you, Lawyered. Today's topic, populism in democracy, is a subject of great importance, interest and concern for the enlightened citizen. Especially in today's election atmosphere, where there is something promised for everyone. Today's program is the second in Surana and Surana's knowledge series this year. Our law firm does programs of topical interest on national and legal issues. And it is our commitment to not only provide exposure to new perspectives for our professionals, but also help understand how lawmakers come into office, how they prioritize their agenda, what is their compulsion, what influences their decision making, etc. After all, they say democracy is a system of competitive lobbies, and these lobbies have great influence on the lawmakers. The format for today's webinar is as follows. Each of our panelists will present their respective views for about 10 minutes on a pre-discussed and pre-agreed topic. After we have heard solutions, insights, views, and anecdotes from each of our panelists, we look forward to what we believe will be a highly interactive and useful panel discussion and a question answer session. I will keep the time and signal each speaker when two minutes are left. We have already started receiving questions and time permitting, we will try our best to have as many of these questions answered. I believe politicians and citizens who are currently going through the election process in different states of India will be inspired, instigated, and initiated by the proceedings of today's webinar. And the roots of democracy in India will get strengthened. With this, I would like to invite our first panelist, Dr. V. S. Sambandhan, to share his views. Dr. Sambandham is the Chief Administrative Officer of the Hindu Center for Policy and Politics. He has been a journalist with the Hindu for three decades, holding various senior positions in India and overseas. He is on the board of studies of the Madras University, an academic council member of the prestigious DG Vaishnav College for Men, and he is the chairman of Asocham's Tamunad Economic Affairs Committee. Dr. Samandam will today speak and present his views on the subject, many layers of populism. Over to you, Dr. Samandam.
can't hear him. The team is unmute. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Kurana, Surana. Uh, thank you for your warm invitation, not only to be with this August uh, gathering, but also with a very distinguished panel. So uh, my thanks to Dr. Surana and his law firm, Surana and Surana International, who've done a lot of work in public interest, including, I remember being with them uh, for the graciously hosting Asocham meetings. Thank you very much, and it's nice to see you again. I trust all of you are in good health. Stay safe, stay protective. And uh, hello to my fellow panelists as well. Nice to see uh, my longtime colleague, uh, Srini, and uh, Professor Atreya, Mr. Devasahayam, Mr. Krishnamurti. And I'm sorry we've not had the opportunity of meeting the other panelists as well. Mr. Shanmugam, right? Yeah. Um, I've, I've, uh, I, I've chosen the many layers of populism more in, more in line to set the context about what we speak and why we speak that and why it is important. We already see questions about why democracy, why is it a dark side to democracy, etc. I hope all of us would be able to give a little bit on what we mean by that. Uh, I have I have with me a prepared text, but I will not be reading from the text. I have a few summary points which I will rush through in the form of a PowerPoint, and then I will go back to my prepared text, but I will not take much of your time. And I hope to finish it within the 10 minutes that uh, Dr. Kurana has uh, requested us to do. And so here we start um, with the slide. Okay. I've, I've called this the many layers of populism because populism is a very amorphous entity. Very amorphous. It is very multi-layered. It is as much used as it is abused. It is deployed to you to describe political programs that are appealing to the popular mode. Quite often, they are they are targeted groups which they come into. Though it is derived in its modern connotation, its origin was a bit more positive. For instance, when the invisible American farmer got together after the Civil War uh, as, a, as a result of in crop pattern, change in land tenure, the late 19th century, they put together something called the People's Populist Party. And they did lobby for a lot of uh, they formed alliances against the Republican Party. And then they set the stage for many legislative reforms, including what we know now as the antitrust law, which for a long time called the Monopolies and Institute Trade Practices Act. It was later subsumed by the Democratic Party and their political tenure has come to an end. Before we go to populism as such, I'd like to set it in the context of the state of three important trucks. The one is the state. The state is a political entity, as you all know, and uh, Weber would call it a compulsory association of domination. And for this organized domination, it would also require other monopolies, like the legitimate use of physical violence in terms of army and police, and extortion in terms of taxation, finance, fines, and other forms of revenue, monopoly of lawmaking, and monopoly over running the affairs of the state in terms of and foreign policy. Next, we have the government. The state would obviously need a government to run it. But, uh, the three forms of government, monarchies, aristocracies, and democracies. China, in its area, practice of uh, government, modern governments, divides this into process of politics and process of administration. So this is a very important distinction which I want to place here, politics and administration. Because without these two, there is going to be a bit of a difficulty in finding where we are. The politics, quite often we confuse or conflate the politics with the process of administration. I'll come to that in a little bit. In democracies, the sovereignty, as we all know, best with the people, and how this sovereignty is exercised is representative democracy. In representative democracy, invariably, populism would come into play because as an elected representative, 
we have to win the popular mandate. There are many ways of doing it. Why is it, why is it that it has become a negative connotation and why so? For that, we should, I think we should interrogate it very thoroughly. Populism is valuable. Deployed by any ideology. It's a right of center perspective, but we know now that it is right of center. It's dominant. Uh, so it's ideological neutral. But the more, de more, more careful part which we have to watch out for is the populist movements that present themselves itself as a non ideological movement. This is a fallacy. As Professor Atreya would agree with me, nothing can be devoid of ideology. Once you take a decision, you are bound to take it in some form or the other, benefit one side of the spectrum or the other side of the spectrum. In economics, we call it a very broad term, not your guns conundrum. So, whichever way you do, you're going to be ideologically oriented. So, there is a dangerous trap which we should all watch out for. So, ideology is a process. In the nature of Indian politics, politics can be very unforgiving. Why do politics, politics uh, resort to populism? In economics, a term, uh, the term of tenure of a, pop, of a pol political person is about five years. In economic terms, it's very, very short term or short term. In, in politics, it's eternity. Now there is a trade off. There is return investment expected by the voter return to investment expected by the elected representative. For the, elect, for the voter, the return to investment would be to him, the society, and what he has in mind, fulfill his needs. For the politician, it's only to be related to power. So the electors are not willing to pay for long-term uh, benefits to kick in. And politicians need to come back to power so they keep jumping out of this cost of populism. Now that takes us to the Famous, very famous the collapse of trickle down policies, the, the supporting of best interests, bottling of public services, and which was, was replaced by direct delivery. Take, for instance, you, you all remember uh, definitely uh, Mr. Trini and uh, Dr. Prana and those of our generation, the droughts of the, uh, in the 80s in Chennai, there was no water. We were given pots where we could go collect water from private supply tanks or government supply tanks. And more recently, scooters instead of public transportation. So these are direct instances where uh, private interests have come in the way of seller, uh, supply of public goods. Uh, on the other hand, there is also benefit coming out from these uh, uh, direct transfers, which would be called as freebies normally. But Let's look at what are called freebies. What are they? Uh, there are two schools of thought about this. One is that it is populism. The other school of thought to which I would subscribe to is that it is, it is the patron client relationship established. But why are we hesitant to call it a patron client relationship? In my view, it is because patron client relationship exists between various patrons and various clients. For instance, sorry, for instance, an industrial house that invests, invests I use it within quotes, a political party. There is a patent client relationship there. There is a transaction relationship there as well. So we so I think we need to cutting the the positive and I emphasize cutting the positive outcomes of government intervention by calling them all as populist and all as freebies. What about extensions to industrial houses? Defeating instances of GST and demonetization on this modern medium industry is what kind of bad is in international trade? How does it benefit? All this takes me back to what a distinguished colleague of mine, Dr. Raman, already wrote in 1975, 1995, and in defense of uh, of uh, uh, populism. And the simple argument is that it is very, uh, up to the elite to understand what populism is and then get back to a real understanding of populism. Today, Hindu has a very good article by uh, Vijay Bhaskar and Arasan on welfare and how it has taken Tamil Nadu off the stream. But also it holds out the right question that 
it cannot be it is not sufficient enough then you have a fascinating article by dr rodrick who talks about uh, the how he how danny rodrick talks about why populism is not necessarily bad for economics is another article i would uh, like to draw your attention to so that is something which is very fascinating and uh, which uh, is worthy of reading in summary danny rodrick makes a distinction distinction between economic populism and political populism and then while he says that economic populism mm. there is a case for it that's definitely not the case of political populism i now go to the final part of it which is political populism and ajay gudawati's book uh, india in india after modi populism and the right is a is a fascinating book i would strongly recommend it it's a fascinating read and in that uh, ajay gudawati is out specifics uh, he says that it is a right wing phenomenon right now but it is a global phenomenon with the exception of some parts of spain is largely right wing oriented and it, but all these have a common denominator they have the common foreign common features the ability to create a people which is us or the imagined hindu mindset in india projecting a strong man does not require elaboration we have the putins of the day we have we had the trumps and we have in our own country we have the prime minister as well who was seen as a strong man uh, polarizing between us and them now this is a subtext that run through india right since partition and now it has come to full flow without any restraint and without any anyone to even be apologetic apologetic about it there is a very dangerous trend the moralization of power and ex exclusion this is something that goes to the very heart of what it is moral policing what do you wear what do you eat <laughs> and bringing the private to the public that you see many of us have lost friends on whatsapp many of us would have seen people talk what earlier was only in living rooms being talked in public the degeneration of public narrative and replacing institutional board of pursuing politics and governance with street mobilization all these attributes are something that we can all relate to that reminds me of a very famous book uh, a book which is far reaching in its in its implications for any journalist manufacturing consent by noam chomsky along noam chomsky's lines i would like to call what we are doing now what we are seeing now is a manufactured narrative narratives are being manufactured a homogeneous hindu the prime minister is infallible uh, hindutva are patriots and others are anti nationalists there is a supremacist rhetoric going on we've seen big lynchings we've seen decline in popular political parties narrative and we've seen the normalization of abuse of language all of these are very very dangerous for democracy as such three examples i can say it's not just with politics but also as permeated to other sector other 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 pillars of government the farm act symbolizes how effect the legislative body can be made the babri masjid verdict where you say yes and no where you say right and wrong throws various questions about the judiciary and my friend uh, mr devan sahay will, will, will certainly agree with me when i say the use of electronic machines and despite the incessant campaign by civil society how the election commission is steadfast on not listening to them it all pointers to which institutional space has been ceded to populist pressure finally what is the way out i think i started off by saying that there is uh, populism is a shortcut for a popular for a political leader unfortunately there is no shortcut out of populism there are only two ways i can see one is to have faith in our democracy we are still a democracy india is still a democracy the world by and large is still a democracy and in, in the, for the, so we have to repose our faith as citizens of the world in democratic institutions and democracies for that to happen is my second uh, wish i would say if i were to say is that there is a need to improve political literacy we all seen india make great strides in literacy as such our strides in functional literacy are not that much 
that political literacy is something completely different and we are completely at a blank when it comes to political literacy. So be both through curricular means and non-curricular means, perhaps something for Dr. Sulana to think about. So once we have more political, uh, politically literate audience, or politically literate, we cannot stop populism, but we can recognize populism for what it is. And therein lies the answer. I thank you very much for your patience, and I'm sorry if I interrupted you with this slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sambandhan. Inspiring and instigating us to think very differently. Ideology, industrial houses, industry groups, uh, inclusive and exclusive policies, independence of the judiciary. You touched upon very different and important topics. I will come back to you with some questions during the Q&A time. Now we go to our next speaker. Mr. K. C. Sundaram, a dynamic intellectual and the founder of two prestigious think tanks, namely the Indian Institute of Public Policy and the EU in a Cooperation Forum. He has graduated from the Willy Brandt School of Public Policy in Germany and is currently also the State Secretary for Policy and Research in Makkal Nidhi Mandram, the party started by the film star. Mr. Kamala Hassan. Mr. Casey Sundram, I believe, can give us insights into how a party makes its policy and its manifesto. Mr. Sundram will speak about freebies and short term benefits. Over to you, Mr. Sundram. Thank you very much. First of all, thanks to Surana and Surana for organizing this webinar. Uh, which is especially the need of the hour now with uh, everyone competing with each other in announcing populist manifestos. And uh, special thanks to Mr. Vinod uh, Surana and Mr. Nikhil Raghavan for inviting me as one of the panelists among illustrious colleagues. And um, it's, very, uh, it's also wonderful to see Professor Atreya and uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Dev Sahayam, whom have been associated for more than a decade. And um, yeah, okay. So, manifesto means a set of policies or aims, but what has become now is more of populist announcements. Parties generally are not interested in a policy document. Even if, uh, even if they are not populist, they wanted the points and numbers to be catchy and attractive. They, uh, they uh, don't want anything to be very specific or it is more... Uh, based on how things are viewed rather than which um, not as um, technically. Anyway, okay. So there is always this debate that whether manifestos are a waste, whether people read it or not. But I find that large section of people give a lot of importance to the manifesto and many people make decisions accordingly. The party should also give more importance to it with uh, one party that I'm associated and also with I'm also hearing from other parties as well. Most of the parties don't give this uh, that much importance in preparing policy manifestos as in it's only trying to get attention of the uh, voters. So this freebies, freebie culture was started prevalently from the 2006 election where DMK announced free TVs. And I think the culture of freebies comes from desperation to win and bad governance and sort of a quick fix to uh, sort of a quick fix. Now, there are different kinds of freebies, free TVs, mixies, wet grinders, and now even washing machines, free LPG cylinders. These are, in my opinion, outright bad. I think this is totally unacceptable and this is, it's, but for the parties, it's kind of win-win because they get them votes and they are all, and once they are in power, they are also able to siphon off money when they give freebies. Often these freebies are cheap, poor products, which doesn't last long. And, uh, and for politicians, it's always very, um, they are very happy to announce projects or the schemes because for, uh, 
for every 100 rupees they spend at least 20 rupees goes to their pocket and this is a, so this freebie scheme they make uh, there's huge corruption involved as well and in, in case of uh, dnk announcing free tvs it helps them for their own business for sun tv group of channels and set up box businesses and uh, we have and this the problems with no, uh, the other problems with these freebies are we have seen that every time a government takes charge in uh, tamil nadu the government finance the fiscal deficit takes a deep plunge in the first few years with spending on these freebies this time the state's revenues revenue deficit is very high, something around 65,000 crores or so, aggravated by the pandemic. And ADMK is in a very desperate move. And um, so they went to the extent of announcing free washing machines where hardly there's water, uh, enough water in most uh, part of the state. And they announced washing machines now. And clearly these are not feasible. It will make the state's finance even worse. At least the DMK's current manifesto, at least they don't say it as they are going to. Uh, uh, presented in the next term itself. They rather call it as a 10-year vision statement. And uh, so I think among the manifesto, I think DMKs, they, it seems that there's a lot of work has gone into that. And uh, also they have created a, a think tank specifically for it, the Dravidian Professional Forum. And um, so there is a lot of work involved in this manifesto. But these parties, when they announce these freebies, they need to explain how they are going to finance these freebies. Most of the time, this it is just that, for example, I see that ADMK, they think that they are so desperate that they won't come back to power, so they want to announce whatever they can, and it is uh, totally ridiculous. Uh, either there should be a um, body which studies how they are going to finance, or or uh, the, uh, people should be smart enough to see that these freebies are not um, possible and not feasible. But I do agree with freebies like laptops, cycles, and free GB data, which I think these are productive goods, which the economically weaker sections might not be able to get it otherwise. But these schemes could also be designed differently in a way that giving 50% um, or even higher subsidies and then making it easier for them to. E uh, making it more affordable. Anything given free, I think, is never valued. Another point coming to um, uh, branding. This Amma Canteen, Amma Water, Amma Simmons, these are generally welcome measures, but the counter argument would be how in the first place food, food inflation was allowed so high, or why prices are high in other sectors or otherwise. And, or not affordable for all uh, sections of the uh, society, which denotes the failure of governance. So going back to MGR's time, we also have this uh, Satunal Zitam, also populist. It is a much needed and appreciated scheme, and many other states in India have followed that practice. So it depends on what kind of freebies or what kind of populist scheme that the uh, parties come up with. Uh, uh, regarding the Amma Canteen and Amma Water, this is publicizing in the leader's name. Also, Kalingir Kapide, or even now, uh, Prime Minister Modi's picture was uh, in the vaccination certificate earlier before they removed it now. These are pure populist measures and brand building. In this context, I also have to, yeah, talking about this, uh, in the recently um, Bihar election, I think Bihar has went another step higher than uh, Tamil Nadu in three weeks, announcing free vaccination. And uh, that's the height of it, I think. Then there are schemes like free solar cooker and free solar water pumps, encouraging people to shift to environmentally friendly options. These are, again, good schemes, but again, could be uh, designed in a better way than giving them higher subsidies and more affordable and um, making people to uh, move towards environmentally friendly options. The next of another thing is free electricity to farmers. This is fine as long as it is metered. I'm a big supporter of being metered. But here none of the parties are willing to take that step. And the party and it is partly understandable because the argument that I hear is the farmers are strongly against it because they think that this metering is a preliminary step in charging electricity. Which I don't agree to that argument. It should be metered and 
one should know that how much electricity is being uh, used by the farmers. So I'm not sure that whether that is going to happen soon, uh, metered, uh, metering of free electricity to farmers. And dole is another uh, thing that dole for women and students and generally for socially and economically weaker section are generally, I think, fine. And it, it is actually, um, um, and uh, DMK has announced 4,000 rupees for COVID relief. Increasing deficits by giving doles is a different thing. It's actually good. You're putting money in the hands of the people who are desperately in need of. And in turn, that would help their purchasing power and in increasing consumer spending. This is like the universal basic income in uh, which is being trialed in few countries like Finland and New Zealand. So um, generally, if you see the uh, Human Development Index in Tamil Nadu is quite high when compared to other states, especially when compared to so-called model states like Gujarat. The, the, you should, one should know that TN is a welfare state and it has struck a fine balance between welfare state, industri industrialization and economic growth. And also development is fairly even across the state. I don't think we are in a dire situation in Tamil Nadu despite this kind of populistic measures and uh, but I think things can, um, once the government is convinced of their governance or if they are confident of winning again I think this freebie culture would come down I guess. Okay, I will leave it with this and um, uh, during the um, discussion, we could come up with other points. Or... Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sundaram. You touched upon three, uh, you touched upon many important points, but three, I would like to come back to you during the question answer session. Uh, you did make a point of uh, freebies being given. I want to mention here that uh, several years ago, I made a strong representation on behalf of the Indian industry in my capacity as Asocham co-chairman for uh, South India. At that point of time, most of the grinders, mixes, laptops, many of these were being imported from China. And I wanted to make a, I made a case that this should be at least made in India and procured from India. You did mention about uh, Glamour, replace a replacing policy in the manifesto. I will come back to you on that during the question answer session. And you did make a mention about uh, manifestos needing, needing to explain how freebies will be provided for. I think this comes out from the Supreme Court judgment of 2014, after which uh, the election commission had uh, given several guidelines. So, in the question answer session, I will touch upon that as well. Now, we will go to our next speaker, Mr. M.G. Deva Sahayam, a very unique personality, a very unique background. Mr. Deva Sahayam is a postgraduate in economics. He served in the Madras Regiment of the Indian Army before moving on to become an Indian Administrative Services Officer, holding several key and senior positions, including being the returning officer for assembly and parliamentary elections and he has been an observer for the election commission of india mr deva sahayam has been deeply involved in democracy and social issues and he was a close associate of lok nayak jay prash narayan during and after the emergency of 1970s he played an important role in two revealing reports brought out by the supreme court judge one on free elections and the other on the role of electronic voting machines. Mr. Deva Sahayam will be sharing with us his views on the constitutional responsibility of the election commission. Over to you, Mr. Deva Sahayam. Good evening, Mr. Surana. Thank you very much for this opportunity. The, the subject of today's webinar is, is <laughs> The, uh, the kind of uh, demo democracy. The, is India a populist democracy? Now, I would like to be very frank, and I even question is India a democracy at all? 
Now that question has come up again. Only twice in the history of independence, India's democracy has been questioned. And I was part of the first questioning. I was in the government at that time. Also in a very key position as the district magistrate of Chandigarh with Jayaprakash Narayan as my enemy number one of the state as my prisoner. I was very, 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 I was watching the whole thing very close. I was also implementing the emergency. So that was the first time India's democracy was questioned. But when the election came in 1977, the election commission played a very critical role and the elections were absurd, almost free and fair and people will prevail and the, the the government that imposed emergency was thrown out lock stock and barrel in spite of the fact the political party that emerged had a very short time to organize themselves it was a two-third majority now at that time the democracy was chopped off as, as you call it jadka jadka method of chopping off uh, and massive damage was made even now it is not india has not recovered from the democracy now, in the past few years, Indian democracy is being again questioned. Is India a democracy at all? There's a spate of international reports, and internal reports also, that India is no longer free. It is only part free. It is a declining democracy. And what is worse, a couple of weeks ago, the Swedish Institute said India is a electoral autocracy. Now, this has got very, very, very significant impact. We call ourselves the world's largest democracy. Democracy by what? Just because the uh, the kind of the, the ritual of elections are being conducted at regular intervals. And of late, sort of deploying massive number of paramilitary forces, police, observers, uh, uh, general observers, uh, financial observers, and uh, police observers. All kind of is a massive deployment of government power, state power, for people to elect the democracy, and then the scheduling, the scheduling of elections, eight stages in, in in West Bengal. I don't know what. On the one hand, Prime Minister says we need one one one, one country, one nation, one election, and in West Bengal, one district has got three phases of election. Krishnamurti is there, my dear friend Krishnamurti is here. I am not, uh, I am just telling the facts. One just doesn't understand. In Tamil Nadu and Kerala, counting is going to take place on May 2nd, but polling is on April 6th. For 25, 26 days, these boxes are lying in storage. It has created tremendous amount of doubts in the minds of the people. So the question is, why? Is, it, is India a democracy at all? Populism comes later because of the faulty functioning of democracy. India democracy moving towards a, uh, the kind of autocracy that we are talking about. The populism is the only way by which politicians can face the people. There is no other way. <clears throat> they have not been able to sustain democracy. They have not been able to defend democracy. They have not, not been able to render justice. They have not been able to do a lot of things that needs to happen in a democracy. A kind of iron fist is being thrown on the people. People are being made to live under fear. And then they have nothing else to offer. So they have to offer all these kind of things that are being mentioned by good friend Sundaram. Everything. Tomorrow they may offer air conditioner, they may offer uh, uh, refrigerator, uh, they may offer everything with no money in the treasury. So the point I am trying to make is that is where I took up the subject of constitutional responsibility of the Election Commission of India. Democracy holding a free and fair election is a constitutional responsibility and the Election Commission of India is the most important to my view the institution in the Constitution of India. Unfortunately like Hanuman Election Commission doesn't seem to know their responsibilities and their power. And unfortunately also, there's a defeatist, defeatist mentality, like last election, 2019 election, they went and told before the uh, Supreme Court that we have no powers. They have 
plenipotentiary powers under Article 324 of the Constitution of India. And there are several Supreme Court judgments which clearly says, yes, they can exercise these powers to ensure free and fair election, which is the exclusive responsibility of the election committee. But, and also, Supreme Court has laid down very clearly, only where there's a specific law directing the election commission to do certain things, like the Representation of People's Act, special law enacted by Parliament, yes, election commission has to adhere to that. Otherwise, they have vast discretion, plenty potential powers to do whatever they want to do in the interest of free and fair election. They are just not doing it. Again, I will mention uh, Mr. T. S. Krishnamurti. Today's election commission is not what the election commission he was presiding over. In fact, we had started along with him, we had started a forum for electoral integrity in 2009-2010 to defend and protect the election commission from unruly kind of uncouth criticism by the political party. Now, after 10 years, I have become one of the strongest opponents of election commission because they are carrying themselves in the most autocratic manner. I have called election commission today the elected, unelected autocracy. I'll tell you two examples, just two examples. The electronic voting machine, we, I don't want to go, go into detail. We have spent a year's time of research with some of the top international brains in the country. I don't think anybody can put together a better, better, better panel of top international uh, technical brains. And they have come out very clearly. The present EVM system, EVM VPAT system in India is unfit for democratic elections. You can use it for student union elections. You can use it for anything else, but not democratic elections where you have, you are transferring sovereignty. As uh, Mr. Samandam mentioned in, in his presentation, in a democracy, people are the sovereign. They are transferring their sovereignty once in five years. And it has to be done in absolutely verifiable, transparent manner. Machine cannot do it. Man, machine is rendering the people uh, blind. You're, you're, you're a blind man voting. Machine may be the best under the sun, but you don't know what is happening inside. I must know to whom I voted. I must know whether what was registered uh, properly. I must know whether it was counted properly. None of these are available in the, in, in the electronic voting machine. <coughs> Say they brought in this BB pad. Voter very verifiable paper audit train. Idea was to do at least I can have a look at. So it must be verified. It must be auditable. Election commission is doing it absolutely. They will not do it. They will say we'll 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 count only one 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 EVM machine in the whole assembly constituency of 250, 300. Only one. It is like this. You see, people are suspicious of um, counterfeit notes. They say there are hundred bundles suspect to contain uh, 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 counterfeit notes. Is counting half the bundle enough? Or as Supreme Court said, two bundles enough. Every bundle needs to be counted. So we ask them, for heaven's sake, you do the electronic voting, do, no problem. You do the electronic counting, no problem. But count the paper slips also. So that way, what I saw is counted. They are refusing. Election Commission themselves should have taken the initiative. Here they are refusing, coming out with all kind of cock and bull stories. And that has created tremendous amount of them. They say, if you criticize the EVM, we will register FAR against you. So now coming to the, this very subject, this very subject. In 2016, both these parties, which Sundaram mentioned, ADMK and DMK, gave a long list of freebies. Madam Jalilita was the chief minister at that time. And she gave a much bigger list. DMK is more prudent. They were very careful. But we in civil society, Forum for Electoral Integrity, made a representation to the Election Commission of India in May 2016. That time, at least the Election Commission went through the motion of issuing notice to both these parties. There is a clear provision the Election Commission can take action under the model, model Code of Conduct, Section 16A. Mr. Um, Mr. Krishnamurti knows where they can issue a notice. After inquiry, they can even cancel their uh, symbol, making it difficult for them to contest. They, they issued a notice. Both the explanations were not satisfactory. The main issue was 
the Supreme Court said you must give financial justification and it must be part of the manifesto. So they did not, and election commission censured the ADMK and issued a caution notice to the DMP. Now, after five years, these two lists are far, far worse. Particularly, the ADMK list is far worse. I immediately brought it to the notice, along with the former election commission orders, to the notice of the chief electoral officer and the election commission. It's more than a week, more than uh, more than more than a week, ten days. I don't think they have taken initiated any action. This present election commission is virtually functus of issue as far as free and fair election is concerned, but is very active in being partisan. partisan in our report, which mentioned by Mr. Surana, we had, I will just some, uh, finish it after this. We had gone to all the six elements of election. One is EVM, VPAT, OT, that I have mentioned. I don't want to go into detail. During the debate, we can talk about it if you want. Then is electoral rolls. Huge flaws have been noticed in the electoral rolls. Election commission is not rectifying. Then money and criminal power and electoral, electoral bonds. Now, look at this, what has happened. When the issue came up, election commission opposed election, uh, ele electoral bond tooth and nail. Ele uh, Supreme Court has been delaying. The case came up yesterday. And uh, election commission said, no need for a stay. They, they, they can collect as many uh, as one lakh crore rupees. After that, you, you take action. Complete Walter Fesci. If ECA election commission is opposed electoral bond at that time, why are they opposing stay order? I mean, absolutely Walter Fesci. Election, uh, then, uh, electoral, then, the, the, then scheduling of the election. Complaints of model code of conduct. Absolutely partisan towards the ruling party. This eight stage the parliament election was seven stage. Then this uh, uh, keeping keep, keep in inside the inside the storage for more than a uh, more than a month in West Bengal and that much period around that much period in in, in Tamil Nadu also. Then gross misuse of media, fake news, absolute chaos is prevailing in the elections. Only physical presence. They are militarizing the elections and through the use of um, um, sort of uh, paramilitary forces, array of observers, fear mongering, they are conducting the election. So no concern for level playing field, no concern for uh, democracy principles in the election, no concern for uh, the kind of uh, uh, democracy that you need. So that is the reason why, since the politicians have nothing to offer as a democracy, which is decaying and degenerating. They are making it up with this freebies so that people can be at least influenced in physical form. I'll give this. I'll, finally, I'll conclude. It is not the job of government to make people mendicants. Social welfare, social justice is all right. That is for those who can't help themselves, help themselves in spite of the help of the government. We are bound to. We are bound to help them, and we are paying taxes only for that. Our poor brethren, our, our brethren who can't help themselves, must be helped in all forms. But certainly not the able-bodied people. They must be provided jobs. You must structure an economic development in such a manner. There must be full employment, so that they can earn their livelihood in a decent manner. Buy things with their own money. Self-respect is involved, honor is involved, and bring up their family. Instead of that, you destroy their livelihood. You know, you saw that what kind of destruction is taking place. And then we are giving free, making them mendicants. Finally, I would like to say that Niti Ayo, I'll tell you why this is happening. Niti Ayo, a couple of months ago, made a great statement. The present policy of the present government is to have five global champions. Government need not help the small people in any manner. These global champions will help them. That is why all this privatization of public sector is going on. Every asset is being transferred to five global champions. We know who these champions are. As far as the people are concerned, populism, this is free, this is free, this is free. I am giving from my, my grandfather's property, prime minister this scheme, chief minister this scheme. So we have made mockery of democracy and it is morphing into an elected autocracy. 
unless we join hands and sort it out and reverse the trend this kind of destruction of india will continue thank you very much thank you sir we saw a combative spirit you did make a lot of important points we are running a little short of time so we are i am going to come back to you during the question answer session on that uh, electoral bonds the role of uh, the election commission in making u turns before the court etc before that uh, i now call upon our next panelist mr shrinivas raghavan a very senior business journalist and a columnist a pioneer of corporate journalism in india and an investigative journalist he is responsible for breaking stories such as the harshad mehta scam the collapse of the uti the return of coke to india among others a mass media specialist mr shrinivasan raghavan is compelled by a desire to tell the truth to be a change agent mr shrinivasan raghavan has been the editor of the hindu business line and he is the recipient of the prestigious lifetime excellence in journalism award mr shrinivasan raghavan would like to share his views on the subject populism the populist measures in elections over to you mr shrinivasan raghavan okay thank you very much dr surana uh, very good afternoon to my fellow panelists and to uh, the viewers watching online um, uh, thank you for uh, remembering me i mean usually uh, when one retires uh, you know particularly with journalists uh, you know once your byline goes off the front pages that uh, you tend to fade from memory pretty quickly so uh, I, i i i suspect that my old friend uh someone had a hand to play here uh in my resurrection so to speak but anyhow thank you very much an interesting subject uh, i think we got uh, started on the right direction you know because we need to have some definitions right what is populism what is a populist measure because one man's populism can be another man's poverty alleviation right so um and you know the thing is that our you know so and and also the role of you know pop, populism or populist uh, acts and measures in politics right so uh, for that we need a little clearer definition of what what is a politi- uh, populist act and what is a political act right so a political act can be easily defined as something which advances the interests of uh, you know uh, a particular uh, person individual ideology grouping whatever and that that you know the anything which is designed to advance their interests uh, not necessarily at the expense of others but definitely to advance theirs it can be deemed a political act um, what's a populist act you know because every uh, uh, every you know political act need not be populist but uh, i think one of the definitions of populism is that every populist act is 100% political that is a populist act is sort of uh, resorted to in order to advance your political uh, interests in, in order to you know uh, enhance your popularity with the voter uh, and in order to win elections so that's one of the fundamental definitions the second definition that we could apply here is that you know because we can have debates about whether a particular act is populist or developmental or aim towards poverty alleviation or redressing societal imbalances or injustices for instance um i think uh, some of them mentioned about uh, you know a political party giving scooters for women i think mopeds uh, for women uh, one party promised in tamil nadu in delhi arvind kejriwal offered free passes on the Uh, public transport buses and metros to women now that was promptly decried by the bjp as a political act but i actually felt that it was also uh, a, 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 you know it was an important measure even though it was 100% implemented by the aam aadmi party and kejriwal for political outcomes he wanted you know there were elections uh, coming up and they, they wanted to sort of you know 
increase their popularity with the voter, voter. That was the intended outcome of the act, the main intended outcome. But there was a secondary outcome, which is that giving women access, free access to public transport is a tremendous tool of empowerment to enable them to participate in the workforce. Of course, uh, the, you know, there's, uh, I think, one of the national sample surveys uh, unfortunately, this current uh, administration has found the findings uh, uh, revealed by many sample surveys to be very uncomfortable, and they have sort of started suppressing the results. But uh, one of Hello? the sample surveys a few years ago um, uh, found that 70, for 76% of women in the workforce, they listed their sole means of transportation as themselves, which meant that they had to walk to work. They could not, they did not yeah, own yeah. personal transport, yeah. they could not afford public transport, and walking was the only means available for them to reach and find employment. So, giving access to public transport uh, free to women is a empowering measure. So, there can be different points of view on whether an act is populist it could be i mean you know by one definition it could be populist but it could also have this thing so i think a clearer definition of a populist act would be something which uh, is a aimed at enhancing the political interest of a particular person ideology political party grouping interest whatever and b fails the test of economic rationale so, if there is no economic lo economic logic attached to this, then it is a pure populist act, um, uh, uh, you know, and uh, not a uh, something which has some kind of uh, other outcomes which can be advanced as the justification for doing this. So, um, many of the admittedly political acts, for instance, uh, previous panelists have discussed the issue of free power for uh, farmers. And uh, so now that that has been justified as uh, you know as, as an essential uh, this thing that you know farmers basically uh, you know are, are produce our food. Uh, food is needed uh, you know for uh, basic security of the population, and therefore providing uh, free power to farmers is an act of uh, economic uh, rationality and not a populist measure, right? Um, there can always be logic, like for instance. Uh, the current uh, government in Tamil Nadu uh, waived uh, uh, loans taken from uh, cooperative uh, uh, institutions for farmers just before the model code of conduct kicked in. But definitely it was an act uh, aimed at uh, the impending elections. And uh, there was a justification advance for it. It said, you know, the farmers had suffered very badly during the, uh, you know, COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, that, you know, uh, plus there were two cyclones in the state which impacted their ability to produce and uh, therefore repay their loans. So the government is stepping into this thing. So, but, you know, was that a populist uh, this thing? By political definition, it was economic rational. There is an economic rational advance to it by, uh, uh, by the government, but uh, uh, like uh, Mr. Sundaram pointed out, the, you know, the, the rub comes when you examine it against all possible options that you could have done, given that you wanted this one particular outcome as one of the necessary outcomes which needed to be obtained. So, therefore, uh, if you if you said that you know that farmers are being impacted because of uh, COVID and because of cyclone, then then that is uh, you know their their economic uh, uh, distress has to be elevated, and that is an non-negotiable outcome of the measure that you take, then what you have to do is to examine a populist act like a loan waiver to see whether that make that is the most economically rational step they could have taken. And then immediately you'll see that most of these populist measures fail the test of logic. For instance, a loan waiver, you know, loan waivers through, there, are, there, are, there have been plenty of loan waivers, you know, Starting from I think 1996 uh, uh, or so, uh, there have been a flurry. In fact, uh, uh, Tamil Nadu I think has done two or three in the last two years. Uh, and they 
basically they've never solved the problem they've not solved the problem of indebtedness of whichever the target audience that you're trying to address whether it is farmers whether it is a poor whether it is uh, micro and small medium enterprises who are you're trying to address with a loan waiver it is not address the fundamental reasons for their indebtedness or poverty trap second is that the money that get spent on this does not actually reach the beneficiary you know the government has to pick up the tab for instance this current uh, loan waiver just from cooperative banks uh, i saw an estimate i think in the hindu uh, which uh, calculated that you know the amount of money some uh, 12400 crores that the government will have to end up paying the cooperative banks in order to write off the loans uh, if that was simply redistributed amongst the target farmers based on existing government data aadhar and uh, this thing then each uh, farmer uh, would have got 40000 rupees and 40000 rupee direct income transfer probably has potentially lot more beneficial outcomes particularly for restarting consumption and growth because it is discretionary spending here what has happened you are simply recapitalizing a cooperative institution there is no guarantee that that money will be uh, you know rolled back into into uh, into further loans and even less guarantee that that money will be rolled back into further loans for the same uh, target audience you see because you are trying to address an economic problem out here so is that solving this thing no it does not so i think you know the problem is that as uh, you know sam pointed out and uh, um, you know as uh, other speakers have also pointed out that when you bring in elections the need to win a popular mandate every few years five years four years six years whatever is the term of office uh, then you are more or less committing yourself to such acts by both those in currently in power and those aspiring for power because it's inevitable you see uh, a, a electoral democracy is a popularity contest with uh, conditions right um, uh, and uh, in order to be popular you have to do certain things and uh, therefore and this this appears to be the easiest fastest route with the quickest payback uh, for the uh, political uh, party concern or the person concern particularly because they are not asked to put the bill so therefore uh, you know there is uh, what, what what is the solution out here i think what you can do is to uh, uh, perhaps impose certain conditions economic justification for the act which is there uh, uh, you know um, uh, that can be certainly as mr dev shah uh, mentioned that can be something which can uh be implemented more forcefully perhaps by the election commission or some other watchdog you can you can also impose certain you know obligations on political parties to because they have control over budgets right the reason you seek power is also to largely get control over budgets and direct spending of public money right uh so you can impose certain conditions and this is not non unconstitutional there is already one such condition imposed on governments it's called the fiscal responsibility and budget management act which basically limits the amount of deficit as say 3% uh, it has been temporarily relaxed by 2 years for the covid uh, a pandemic impact but otherwise the act says that if uh, you know your deficit cannot exceed 3% of gdp which means that what, uh, what the act is essentially saying is that you can spend the money any which way you want but you can't borrow to back all your ideas uh, not more than the extent of 3% of gdp that puts a limit on how much of so because here what is one of the what, what is so insidious about uh, populist spending sprees is that the return is enjoyed by the spender immediately they win the election they get the votes but the bill is paid by future generations years down the line next government three governments down the line you know because you are borrowing to this thing you don't have the revenue as uh, speaker the pointed out no state has the revenue to back the kind of welfare welfare is measures that they wish to take so 
uh, this is in 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 some is I think the the challenge. And uh, as, as long as we have this process of electoral democracy, uh, you're bound to have populism. And I think perhaps the only way to restrict this is to put legal constitutional measures in place, which at least limits the extent of damage. Right. So you limit the extent of the damage because as long as you have this kind of electoral democracy, I think there is no escaping populism. So I'll, I'll stop here and maybe we can go into other details later. Thank you, Mr. Srinivasan Raghavan. You have touched upon some very crucial points, legal and constitutional safeguards to limit the damage. I will come back to you on that in the question answer session. Now, I would like to call upon our next panelist, Mr. T. S. Krishnamurti, the legendary former Chief Election Commissioner of India. T. S. K. as he is popularly known and spoken about with reverence, Mr. Krishnamurti started his career in 1960 in the Bank of India. Later, he joined the Indian Revenue Service in 1963 and served in several central ministers. He served with the IMF in Ethiopia and Georgia and as the Chief Election Commissioner was an observer to elections in Zimbabwe and the United States presidential elections in 2004. He was appointed by the Supreme Court post-retirement to conduct elections to the, Brit to the BCCI, among many other important tasks he has done in his life. Mr. Krishnamurti would like to share his views on is India an illiberal or populist democracy? Over to you, Mr. Krishnamurti. We, are, we can't hear you, sir. You are muted. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Okay. First of all, I, I thought Mr. Venkatesh Atreya wanted to speak before me. He showed his hand, but be that as it may, I will make it as brief as possible because I have an appointment at about 5.30. I didn't know that it will stretch beyond this uh, uh, 5 o'clock. But be that as it may, first of all, uh, let me make it very clear that this discussion is about populist democracy. And I thought we were going to talk about the yields of populist democracy in India. But uh, when I heard Mr. N.G. Devasahai, a good friend of mine, he seemed, I have heard a lot of complaints against election commission about the conduct of elections. For the first time, I received a complaint that the populist democracy in India is due to the election commission of India. That's very remarkable. I think he may be certainly free to criticize the election commission in any manner he wants, but I will reply some of the points a little later. The democracy is intellectually a very stimulating and emotionally very attractive topic of the day and is going through a very exciting phase of evolution, democratic evolution. A lot of people have praised democracy as a best possible form of government. But what Bertrand Russell said was the merits of democracy are negative. It does not ensure good government, but it, it, provide, it prevents certain evils. It is possible in a democracy for the majority to exercise a brutal and wholly unnecessary tyranny over the minority. It would even, I would even go beyond Russell that in a democracy, even a, a tyranny of the minority or the majority also can happen. So it is not democracy is not a cure for all system of governance. And democracy cannot be achieved only by electoral democracy. Unfortunately, there is a wrong impression that the election commission is responsible for the poor state of democracy in India. I'm afraid Mr. Mr. Devasaham is far off the mark. He's certainly entitled to criticize the election commission. But to say that uh, the failure of the judiciary, the failure of the media, the failure of the politician, the failure of the political parties, and all of them are attributable to the election commission. I'm sorry, Mr. Devasahai, you must kindly think over it. The second point I thought I should say is that we are in the midst of a seventh decade of democratic experiment and experience. 
Democracy has been subject to widespread and variegated critical reviews based on countless publications. You knew the about now the success of any democracy is contingent upon a number of factors, including its history, geography, culture, and socio-economic conditions. The multi-party system, with more than 1,000 registered political parties in this country, less than approximately 50 political parties contest election in the country now, but they have 1,000 registered political parties. They are the primary guilty parties for the populist democracy that we have in India today. We have not regulated the political parties, and I do not think election commission, as Mr. Say Deva Sahai said, that has all the plenary powers to regulate all the political parties. I am afraid he should go through all the judgments of the Supreme Court to find out that we have a limited view. Our Bible is the Constitution of India and the Representation of People's Act, and only in a place where there is a legislative vacuum, we have a power in the interest of free and fair election. Not everywhere. I, I thought only the, um, uh, the people of India are not familiar with the, with the role of the election commission in the conduct of elections. Uh, it's very unfortunate that many people think that the populist democracy in India is because of the failure of the election commission of India. What is the reason? Why is our media behaving so badly? Now, you saw the, uh, one of the things I thought I'll bring it. Now, suppose a judicial judgment is given. As we are questioning the very decision of the Supreme Court. You can certainly question the Supreme Court. Supreme, you can go for a review, you can go for an appeal and so on. But to stand on the road, block the road, make it, uh, the people cannot even move out on the road. Is this a constitutional promise that we have given? Similarly, uh, uh, the rule of law is made of mockery of democracy by frivolous litigation by guilty parties. Anybody can go to the court and get a stay or can certainly delay the judgment for five to ten years. Now talk about the review petition, the election petitions filed in the court. How many of them are dis disposed of? The constitution says preferably it should be disposed of in six months. Are they doing it? Is the, is the Supreme Court of India also a populist favoring populist democracy? Certainly not. They have their own problems. You have to understand the difficulties of each institution. You have to make corrective action against them. Now, the laws passed by the parliament, the, 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 the constitution of India is supposed to be one of the most unique documents in the, in the world, and it is all praised by uh, constitutional experts. Now, if you could do not agree with the law, the best way is to go to the court. You, if instead of going to the court, they have found it easy to protest on the roads, block the movement of the people, and then force the government to take a decision. Is this the way democracy is to be run? Is this, uh, is this uh, illiberal democracy? Unfortunately, uh, the Western thinkers say India is an illiberal democracy. On the other hand, I would say India is a licentious democracy. It has given freedom to too many uh, institutions and too many individuals to take the democracy in any direction that they want. Political parties have not been disciplined at all. Now, we are talking about the manifestos issued by the political parties. Now, the matter went up to the Supreme Court. And I, the, I actually assisted the lawyer who went to the Supreme Court to argue the case, if Supreme Court, instead of giving a specific direction, they said election commission can draw broad guidelines. Is this the judgment that you that will help you in uh, preventing from populist democracy? On the other hand, my view is that every promise made by a, by a section of voters is a bribe. And the Supreme Court must have said, no, you can only promise public goods in the manifestos and not private goods. Could they do it? Then will you say the Supreme Court is promoting populist democracy? You have to understand the, the reality of the situation here. The manifestos have been misused by all political parties. Can election commission say that you, 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 you cannot promise uh, these cycles or grinders and so on? Then the, one, the only thing that they have said is you have to ensure that it is reasonable. What is reasonable? That will be questioned in the court again. Now, I, my own... Uh, my own grievance is that Indian politics has got into a distorted democracy. Political parties and civil servants are responsible for most of the ills of democracy in this country. The rule of law has not been enforced properly. And if the rule of law is enforced properly, for example, the state police, the way in which the state police functions, when the election commission changes the director general of police, the 
human cry is raised because they say the law and order situation has been taken over by the state by the election commission election commission has been given authority only to regulate the police in relation to the conduct of election if the director general of police acted in a biased manner in the conduct of the election the election commission will jolly well shift the director general of police and i do not think uh, one can um, uh, question the effectiveness of the election commission so my own uh, impression is that most of the uh, institutions like media the judiciary the the, um, uh, the political parties and so on they have all been misdirecting them tells and the democracy in this country complete status of distorted democracy i thought i'll just complete with what uh, complete my uh, presentation with what justice krishna has said years ago which holds good even today i'll just read a small portion of it not the entire portion he says we had a great start with adult franchise and equality for sex and creed non discrimination as the rule of law parliamentary process as an expression of people's power secular instrumentalities and institutions of justice and administration we must take stock now and glance back at all those decades to which we marched but did not progress messed up our affairs and corrupted the public life of course we have achieved great things and in some regards have astonishing development which is the envy of other countries nevertheless with all our boasts and all our hopes our masses are unfree our millions of people remain in unspeakable misery our public life is corrupt our spiritual fiber is failing our socialism is specious and our exploitative order is flourishing the five star of culture and ill starred communities are a social contradiction i am neither a psychic cynic nor a chronic pessimist i have hopes about our national resurgence the maladies that afflict us as a nation are many but true remedy is in recapturing the very values which once illumined our past and we fought as we fought the british gandhi insisted on and our uh, on and our lead, political leaders richly possessed certain remarkable values which have disappeared in the national scene today so the constitution is the way in which it is implemented it is not the election commission alone which can uh, implement the uh, uh, constitution all other stakeholders have equal responsibility our populist democracy is not only uh, is partly illiberal but it is more licentious democracy and the sooner we address these issues the better it is thank you very much thank you very much sir you made a very important point that every stakeholder is responsible for the state of today's democracy and the indiscipline of political parties has played a very important role in the current state of affairs now we will quickly move on to our next speaker mr professor venkatesh atreya who is a highly distinguished and quoted ex economist he has a btech from iit madras and a phd from university of wisconsin madison usa he has taught economics for 3 decades at the bharat jason university professor venkatesh atreya is a prolific writer he has authored several best selling books articles and reports including a report on food security by the ms found uh, swaminathan foundation and the world food program professor venkatesh atreya would like to share his thoughts on the top topic is populism good for democracy over to you professor you are muted sir i am muted myself ah now you are muting me okay am i am i audible now yeah can i continue hello yes yeah. my clock my clock starts now i hope not not 5 seconds earlier uh, let me just quickly say that i am not going to refer to all the previous speakers but uh, the most striking thing about the discourse on populism is the enormous double standards that seem to prevail for example in 9, 2019 when there was the talk by businessmen of you know uh, vehicles not being sold or biscuit boxes not being sold we had a finance minister who dramatically reduced the corporate tax rate to a flat 22% no questions asked she even said that this would entail a loss of 1.45 lakh crore rupees in a full financial year i did not see any part of the corporate media 
murmuring about an unnecessary tax concession. This is the symmetric equivalent of a freebie, is a freebie to the corporate sector. But we seem to treat that with great gentleness because we have this uh, belief system that every tax concession will lead to greater investment, greater employment, greater output, although these hypotheses have not been tested at all in the entire 30 odd years of liberal neoliberal policies. So let me start with that, that we, uh, the elite, including myself, we, we live in a world where we believe that we have the answers and we have the right to tell people what they should do. Uh, in fact, I know that someone like Sundaram, my dear friend, is very sincere when he, when he makes the points about the freebies he was making. But even in that case, I must tell him from my own personal experience of a survey in Tamil Nadu, yes, it is true that perhaps the DMK had, uh, you know, a, a TV company in mind when they, you know, announced free TVs. But the villages I went to and I talked to respondents who are not DMK people, their response was the first time in my life I'm watching news on a television channel. No, you and I are somewhat more privileged. I'm not saying, therefore, that that is a good idea. No, not at all. I would rather that we have a fiscal policy framework, which is not lost in this stupid obsession with the fiscal deficit, which arises from a complete uh, deregulation of international capital flows in terms of finance. We need a more uh, reasonable fiscal policy framework where the rich get taxed a bit. We have a country with enormous inequality. We have no estate duty. We have no wealth tax. And we have extremely low tax rates. And our corporates don't even pay those taxes quite often. Likewise, they take money from publicly owned banks, but don't repay it always. We, we shout and scream from rooftops and farmers get a loan waiver, but they're quite silent when the big guys get away with huge uh, uh, you know, loan uh, defaults. And uh, now we want to interest the banks with them. Extraordinary. We live in a country, this is populism, you ask me, of a right-wing kind, where you want to hand over the banks to the same guys who looted them. I would say that uh, the danger to India's democracy does not come from left-wing economic populism. It comes much more from right-wing political populism, where the nation is other. You have a vast majority who are taught to hate the rest of the country as the other. And this right-wing populism masquerading as nationalism, a lovely word in my childhood is part of patriotism, but no nationalism is become a bad word. This is right-wing populism, hate politics, this is the grave threat to India's democracy, one. Second, the other grave threat, obviously, is the enormous concentration of economic power. Why do we imagine that economic power does not translate into political power? We are worried about masses grabbing uh, washing machines. We are not looking at how the elite have captured the state. The big corporate sector today, I mean, look at, look at the very budget process. Who do they invite for discussions with the government? Do they invite farmers and workers? They invite the corporates, right? Of course, I'm talking to people who are also involved with Aswacham. I know they have very good attitudes and they think uh, critically about issues. But let's look at the process. We have a political process that simply sidelines ordinary people. If you are serious about democracy, one of the first things you should be asking for is much greater decentralization and devolution from the center to the state to the local bodies. People are talking about the state government finances as if it comes from the heavens. I mean, the central government has been squeezing the states massively the last six, seven years, particularly the last two, three years, squeezing them of all the revenue. Every time the central government gives huge concessions to the corporate sector in corporate tax rates or income tax rates, it is the states who suffer because it's part of the divisible pool. Every time the government of India seeks to raise revenue by cess and surcharge, not terrible to the states. You have 15 finance companies. What is going on? You have 15 finance companies is making matters much worse. Now, I think, you know, you can't talk about one inequity at a time. If we're talking about populism, I would say, let's ask some few hard questions. 67% of the abouts of total tax revenue of the government of India and all the states put together comes from indirect taxes. And a good part of the indirect taxes are paid by ordinary working poor. Now, we have a fiction in this country which says corporates are wealth creators. We saw the pandemic told us that if the workers don't work, wealth doesn't get created. But we have this fiction that is mouthed by our leaders, Prime Minister, Finan Minister, what have you. We have, in terms of uh, political populism, we have, a, we have a party which has perfected the art of purchasing MLAs, up, MLAs after they've been elected on the other party tickets. Now, to me, that is right-wing populism right there, standing, facing, you know, in your face, in your face, right-wing populism where I can purchase MLAs. 
we worry about freebies we don't worry about uh, a party purchasing mlas all the time from one state to another they have a special department which is handling that i think so we, we really need to have a different understanding a more uncluttered understanding of the whole fiscal framework i don't agree with the uh, the whole frbm act because the frbm act by the way is a bit of a joke because government of india has found a hundred different ways to dress up its uh, expenditures to make the fiscal deficit come within the parameters yet they have never achieved it except for one or two years 2004 we passed the frbm act it said by 2008 9 your deficit fiscal deficit must become 3% of gdp when does it come it doesn't come partly because we simply have had to spend more i personally think frbm act is a silly act because the way it is done you could argue in principle nothing stops the government from raising resources but the moment the government raises resources to lower deficits people say what about incentives how can you tax the corporate sector they are providing jobs they are causing the growth of the economy now my argument is not that we must tax them till they flee no there must be moderate rates of taxation but that must be a public discourse on this why is that beyond discussion why is only what is given to the poor becomes suddenly a topic of discussion i don't support by the way the mode of giving these kinds of physical items to people in instead of actually having an effective decent redistributive taxation system and a social justice system but i do remember we grew up in tamil nadu right i do remember people making fun of the midday meal scheme today nobody does now we are saying actually and even the americans were doing it in the schools we said oh wonderful how is the american system is so good but in india midday meal scheme are opposed by the same elite that are talking about freebies now likewise today we are saying that in fact when the kids come in in the morning from households where they don't have going to have food so they are working in food security we should give them a glass of milk and some snacks i see nothing wrong with that i don't see that as a freebie sundaram is right that if you give them a washing machine but don't give them water or if uh, like the central government you give them a gas stove but don't give them cylinders or make them 1000 rupees hmm? these are all obviously the political i'm not at all arguing in defense of the political parties and the manifestos i do recognize that there are serious uh, you know credibility issues with those manifestos but the issue of populism is different like there are two broad strands of populism of which the far more dangerous strand of populism is right wing political populism which creates the other which creates a hate politics and it is unfortunately in this country that kind of right wing populism seems to vibrate with economic neoliberalism to seem the corporate hindutva regime that we have today in this country seems to be in perfect sync with right wing populism and neoliberal economic policy and of course this particular regime we have now has the additional distinction of the silly demonetization episode disastrous to the country it also has a completely haphazard uh, silly gst system you are now deprived the states of any power to tax any goods and services except four items tobacco alcohol uh, petrol and diesel and petrol and diesel anyway is taxed heavily by the center you have reduced states which represent linguistic nationalities into petty municipalities we need a we need a discussion in this country when we discuss democracy and the threat to it the threat to democracy in this country comes from money power comes from the electoral bonds election commission had the spine at one time to protest the electoral bonds the current dispensation doesn't seem to protest it the problem comes from a pm cares fund which is completely non transparent problems come from a completely non transparent opaque elite which feels it is destined to govern and it's marriage with hindutva today in our country so my idea you know the whole discourse on populism must be broken up disaggregated economic populism political populism and i i would rather see a rule based uh, policy framework where we say we, these are our priorities food healthcare education we will spend on this and we will tax the rich to pay for it but we don't do that any more, any suggestion to raise a marginal tax rate from 22% to 24% and i'm sure will be greeted with howls from the media saying my god this is anti growth i'm not suggesting you do it today today is a bad time to do it but today by the same token those of us who support universal basic income program somehow get very upset if uh, a party says that we'll give a house housewives 1000 uh, uh, rupees a month now either you are for uba or you are not in today's context such a gift may even help improve the demand i'm again i'm not recommending it to make it very clear i'm distancing myself from both these manifestos but i am saying that our attitude to freebies is rather janus faced 
but attitude to something called populism is absolutely Jainist based. So I would prefer a, a more impartial analytical discussion of right wing hate politics populism and left wing social justice populism, which also has its limitations. I mean, because we obviously have to look at fiscal constraints. I'm an economist. I'm not going to say spend whatever you want. But why are we not discussing the question? Why do we have large fiscal deficits? We have large fiscal deficits precisely because we've offered far too many tax concessions to the rich. The rich in India get taxed far less than rich in other parts of the world. Once upon a time, you could have argued the opposite. But today, you can't argue that. Today, the Indian corporate sector gets taxed so lightly, it doesn't let go of any of its exemptions. And assuming it pays taxes, it pays much less than most counterparts elsewhere would pay. So I think I think that you know the you must treat these symmetrically. A tax reduction for the rich on the ostensible ground that this is an incentive to invest and create jobs is an unproven proposition. A, a freebie to the poor, quote, I hate the term freebie by the way, because don't forget that the poor or not, not simply the poor, they're working poor. They produce the wealth of this country. The poor cannot afford not to work in India. The only section which can afford not to work in India is the rich. They can afford not to work. Poor cannot afford not to work. Okay, you lost your voice. That's yeah. not a issue. Oh, really? I'm able to hear myself very well, but <laughs> you're not able to hear me? Now? Sundaram? You can hear me or not? If yeah, I, I can hear, you. hear him very well. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I don't understand yeah. where the problem Something. is. But yeah, well, the short, you know, I, I have not yet seen any notice from uh, from Sundaram. Yeah, Rich, Rich Swing Jays, yeah. JP says you can hear me very well. Uh, so does, uh, well, I don't know, but we know. Maybe it's uh, maybe I spoke too fast, uh, you know, so it must have been garbled for you. But Sundaram no, knows how rapid. Very well. Please. Please go ahead. All right. Okay. No, we because it will be 10 minutes. And I'm not going to violate your two minute uh, rules like some of my predecessors did. I want to rush and Always. get my points across, which is basically that, you know, the discussion on the threat to democracy has to go beyond an obsession with something that you choose to call freebies or call populism. Historically, as in fact, uh, VS was pointing out, populism was the uh, political trend with the American People's Party, which brought in very good legislation, anti-monopoly legislation, uh, uh, progressive tax income tax rate, and so on. Today, populism has been made a bad word. And a good friend like uh, Redmi Srinivasan will is willing to accept that pejorative connotation. I'm, I'm not going to contest that. I'm, I'm contesting the pejorative connotation associated with the word populism. There is populism and populism. There's populism which can be genuinely in the interest of the people. And there's populism of the hate variety, which we have unfortunately plenty of in our country and many other countries across the world, with strong men of various kinds. That, of course, I think is something, I'm sure Raghavir will agree with me that that's something that we have to avoid, that kind of writing populism. But on left-wing populism, I think we need to take a careful look. I'm not justifying every demand from working people, but I am saying that our larger fiscal financial constraints are not immutable. And if we decide in the first instance to tax rather than borrow, then we will have far less need to borrow, provided we are willing to tax effectively. Problem is we are not willing to tax effectively. And the fellows who don't pay the taxes are the ones who provide money to the political parties to get into office. Now, we don't talk about the national level corruption from the big national parties. But the only party which I can say, which uh, the left parties are relatively free of this kind of uh, disease. But most mainstream political parties are in fact beholden to the rich in the process of electoral funding. So one important suggestion would be public funding of elections is one way to prevent uh, this kind of uh, what you guys consider uh, a dangerous populism. I don't necessarily consider all of it as dangerous. I would certainly prefer to see Tamil Nadu government spend more on health and education and malnutrition and so on, rather than just on uh, air conditioners and fans and mixes and grinders and washing machines. But I don't like a selective outrage only against that. I think we need to be more consistent in our attitude to these issues. I don't know, Dr. Sorana, how much money I have, time I have. I have one minute to go. Maybe I can even spare that to you guys because all of us have been talking for too long. The audience will be tired. But the long and short of it is there is populism and populism. The economic rationale that my good friend Srinivasan referred to, what is the economic rationale of tax reductions? Has there ever been worked out? Have we had any white paper in the last 30 years that tells us what were the 
jobs created from X amount of investments? What was the amount of tax benefits that the corporate sector got? And what is the social cost benefit analysis? We don't have it. It's a, it's a belief system. We believe that if you give concession to the corporate, they will invest. Now, it's so absurd, especially in the middle of a recession, in, like in 2019, for the finance minister to announce the huge tax concessions. Corporates pocketed that. They said, we can't invest now. There's no demand in the market. When you, when you should be attacking demand, creating demand, you want to offer supply side concessions. Now, some of uh, economic, economic analysts in the media don't uh, open their mouths on this. For them, this kind of uh, pro-corporate populism is fine. In fact, our country is a country where, which is on corporate welfare, basically. Putting it a little extremely, but I think it's important to give it a shock. Okay, thank you. I'm done, Dr. Surana. You'll be happy to hear that. Oh, you're not hearing me at all. Ranaji. Nice and take, yeah. आवाज नहीं आता है क्या सुरेंद्र जी क्या हो रहा है आई थिंक यू कैन गो ऑन फॉर फॉर अ हाफ अ मिनट मे बी नो नो आई एम डन आई डोंट वांट टू गो ऑन आई मीन आई व्हाट्स द पॉइंट ऑफ सेइंग द सेम थिंग अगेन एंड अगेन आई एम जस्ट यू नो दिस हैज बीन गोइंग ऑन फॉर सो लॉन्ग एंड आई हैव मेड माय पॉइंट्स एज शार्पली एज आई कैन फॉर दैट दी एट द रिस्क ऑफ बीइंग टू शॉर्ट ऑन दिस इशूज बट ठीक है वी कैन हैव अ सेम डिस्कशन सम अदर टाइम बट I'm just disgusted by the hypocrisy and double standards surrounding the discussion of populism in this country, Absolutely. among the elite. Absolutely, yeah. So that is a client-to-client relationship, patron-client relationship, which is far deep into it, you know. <laughs> Tell me, Anna. <Anna-Nam. laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. No, very good people actually sincerely believe what in this. I don't know, yeah. but there are many. I mean, like my friend Srinivasan is a very, very decent guy who believes in the fiscal deficit uh, legislation being seriously important. I happen to disagree with that, partly because I believe that the state has other levers which it can use, which is willing to put some restrictions on the inflows and outflows of capital as finance. It is also willing to effectively tax the well-to-do. Then it can and borrow less. I'm also all for borrowing less if we can manage it, but because states don't tax. Because they first go in for borrowing, we have a problem. So I would say tax. If you can't tax, borrow temporarily for productive purposes. But don't look at any borrowing for the government as somehow, you know, seriously wrong. It's ironic, you know, that you have a country where the private corporate sector borrows from publicly owned banks <laughs> without being accountable to the people. But an elected government borrowing is seen as not legitimate receipt. The fiscal deficit concept is a political argument for privatization. Because capital receipts are Okay, no, you sell, you disinvest. With capital received, they are okay, but not if you borrow. So, fiscal deficit uh, obsession is actually an argument for privatization. I agree. I agree. But okay. perhaps uh, one could trace it back to economics and where it all Yeah, World Bank notion. World Bank I don't notion. Know, I don't Musgrave, no, let me tell you, Mus- Musgrave doesn't wrong. have fiscal deficit of this kind defined in this way. I mean, uh, you know. Thank, thank you, thank you so much for that, uh, uh, Professor Atreya. I think uh, while we're waiting for Dr. Sarana to join in, he is having some connectivity gaps on his end. Uh, we can start off with uh, the audience questions. Um, I am unfortunately uh, not as familiar with uh, the esteemed panelists here. Uh, I think uh, cannot uh, I cannot be replacing or attempting to replace Dr. Sarana at all on that that matter. So what I will be doing is I will pose the questions uh, and and the floor will be open to the esteemed panelists and kindly whoever uh, uh, wants to pick up a question and uh, answer it uh, may please feel free to do so. Um, the very first question that we have is from one Mr. Shikhar Gupta. Now uh, Shikhar asks, why is it said that populism is a threat to democracy at the very base of it? Um, if anybody is willing to pick this up and uh, yes, please, please. I think we'll start with Professor. Yeah, no, as I said, there is populism and populism. Uh, the greatest threat to Indian democracy comes not from something called populism, but from the enormous concentration of economic power in the hands of the few and the enormous disposition of the mass of the people. Of course, also from social hierarchies. Ambedkar was on target when he said, we've got ourselves a constitution that guarantees political equality, but doesn't guarantee economic equality or social equality. So the threat to democracy comes from privilege, 
due to birth or due to wealth or whatever. And I think uh, right-wing populism, which appeals to something called nationalism, defines it in a particular way. And I agree with our chief election commissioner that there can be minority fundamentalism also, not just majority fundamentalism. But whatever fundamentalism it is, if it seeks to other a section of the population and rule by promoting hate, that kind of right-wing populism, I would definitely oppose. Thank you so much for that, uh, Professor Atreya. I think uh, Dr. Samandan also had uh, something to add to that. That's fine. Uh, I second uh, Dr. Atreya, Professor. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Doctor. I think the next question so that we will take up. I would like to intervene here. First of all, right. why does populism happen? Why does populism happen? To make it a threat to democracy. The factors that make populism happen are the threat to democracy. Populism per se may not be. Now, as I mentioned uh, uh, during my uh, intervention, that uh, a policy decision has been, uh, has been taken. No, I'm just talking from what uh, Professor Atharika was saying. That India's policy is only to build up five global uh, champions. The all assets need to be transferred to them. Only big, big is beautiful. Today, the concept is big is beautiful. You are pushing more and more people outside the mainstream economy. A kind of apartheid policy is being followed. When massive number of people, vast as it is, about 60% of people, in my view, are outside the mainstream economy. They are at poverty levels or near poverty levels. So when you are concentrating, building up an oligarchy, depriving people of their own sources of income, you are not generating uh, jobs, you are not generating income for them, actually they have, have to resort to populism. So the factors that is generating populism are the threat to democracy. That is now going on, why? Absolutely why? No holds barred. Open statement that will only support big people, big is beautiful. Small can vanish and jump into the uh, Bay of Bengal. Hmm. Yeah. I would like to request Mr. Krishnamurti if he, I mean, are we, can we unmute, sir? There's some problem there. Okay, I have Krishnan, been unmuted. Can you hear me? I think I've been unmuted now. Sir, sorry, sir. Can sorry for that. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. No, I just want to make a small point uh, with uh, regard to what uh, Dr. Venkatesh Atreya uh, made. I, I substantially agree with him that we have to be much more selective in populism. That's why I said in the Supreme Court, we argued when the manifestos issue came, Mr. Dattar Arvind Dattar mentioned that if public goods are promised in the manifesto, they are welcome. But if private goods are offered, they are not welcome. So we have to be very selective in offering uh, to the people what the government can offer. But here again, one party says we have a vision for 10 years. Another party says we have a vision for 20 years. How can they commit the future generation for such uh, you know, promises where the, I think democracy has no meaning at all? So in my opinion, when the manifestos are issued, it must be made very clear that they should be only for public goods and that it must be for a period of five years and not beyond. There is no point in making huge promises, misleading the voter, you know, or getting the voter confused as to what to do. So there must be some regulation required on the manifestos. Either it should be done statutorily or by a court of law. The selection commission has no authority to issue restrictions on the manifesto. They can only broad, the Supreme Court has said we can issue broad guidelines. What does it mean? It means they have no power to enforce it. Mr. Samandam. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sulana. My uh, my intervention, my request is for an intervention from uh, Mr. TSK. Uh, there have been panelists who suggested about uh, state funding of elections. Uh, how feasible is it? Has 
has there been any study by the election commission that's my first question my second question would be uh, we see the election commission very active during elections sir. we see it very active in uh, electoral literacy uh, why is it that it goes into a slump in between general elections although technically all year round there are some elections on the other is there anything which the election commission can do to uh, further be visible in terms of um, electoral literacy in terms of monitoring political parties even without elections i think this would also fall in line with what mr devasahayam uh, also suggested uh, here again first first i'll take up your uh, your question relating to electoral literacy i'm afraid unfortunately many people do not know what kind of work has been done by the election commission in promoting electoral literacy i wish some of you could go to the website and see the publications that they have brought to improve the awareness of the people to improve the civic awareness and to improve voter awareness on matters relating to the election it is not that the election commission is sitting idle between the elections secondly as far as the state funding you said you mentioned uh, i do not approve of state funding of elections but i approve of what, is, uh, what i call this public funding of elections the corporates should not give any donation to political parties what is happening today is corporates are forced to give donation both to the ruling party and to the opposition party for various reasons and they are expecting certain things in return from them and most of them either do it by the oil transaction or by what they have recently introduced as the electoral bonds in fact electoral bonds is the worst thing that they have government has come out for uh, promoting what so called transparency in funding of elections my suggestion is corporates and individuals should be allowed to contribute donation to a national state election fund it should not be given to political parties and the national election fund should be used to conduct elections and to finance the candidates after having a some sort of a the broad guidelines and consultation with all registered political parties secondly the number of political parties which has been registered although supreme court has not been very very strict in about allowing uh, 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 has been uh, not very has been very liberal in allowing political parties to form we wanted to restrict the number of political parties supreme court did not approve of it but i think there is one area where probably we have to be little more strict about the entry of, they should contest election there is no point Um, registering as political party and they don't contest election this must also be um, statutorily brought about and thirdly i as i said the national election fund should be used for conducting the elections and the and the party should not be allowed to receive any donation except from its own members in fact in canada this is the practice the party the party can receive donations only from their members not from outside to the government all the public funding of election should take place i have myself suggested to the government to the election commission election commission has also endorsed this opinion there is no need for donations to be given in the manner it is being given now and this is one of the reasons why the politics has become dirty in this country the funding of elections has to be done differently there may be different the different alternatives available but i think this is done the better <coughs> डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन सिस्टम But they have yes. Sir, we have a question on the role of media in elections. On one side, the media has a duty to as a fourth pillar of democracy, and on the other hand, they have economic interests. They are all owned by big business houses. So, how do you see this conflict pan out, and what are your views on this? Uh, do you want me to answer or somebody else is answering? Sure, sir. You can start, please, sir. Yeah. B S can also answer. <laughs> yeah, if anybody else wants to answer, I have no problem. I or can. I can uh, no, B S is a media person. Me, perhaps. Yeah. 
Actually, he is both a media person. Yes. You know, uh, let me let me start. First of all, you know, there is this popular misconception. You know, you use a very wide ranging sweeping term uh, like media. And actually, I have a few players in mind when you use the term. So when you say media, you mean certain, you know, large organized media players. Today, the reality is that every political party, every business in house, uh, virtually every candidate in any election uh, owns some kind of media channel or the other, right? There is no control over that. Um, uh, yes, it is true that uh, large sections of the organized media, uh, the ones with uh, reasonable reach among the public at large, are controlled by powerful business interests. You know, again, this is something which has been brought upon themselves largely by the media because ownership of media has always been concentrated. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, the situation, say, in the pre-digital era, um, before the onset of satellite television and definitely before the onset of digital media, media ownership was concentrated in the hands of half a dozen owners who controlled, you know, various parts of the country in a sort of informal uh, oligopoly, you know, and uh, they they lobbied very strongly against introducing new capital into the business. They prevented, uh, you know, the entry of foreign capital. They prevented the, uh, you know, or largely stymied the, uh, you know, the entry of public capital. Yeah, uh, the disruptor disruption actually came uh, in the form of digital uh, media, where you know the entry barrier was lowered. So today, to to just put up a website uh, doesn't cost very much money, and you can do it completely for free on social media platforms. So anybody and everybody can become a media outlet. So the the challenge really here is that I think that uh, unless you have strict laws in place uh, in terms of say cross holdings, what is the kind of control that uh, a certain you know you know how how much or to what limit. Uh, you know, uh, you can allow dominance or concentration in the sector. You're bound to have this situation, you know, and and unfortunately, it is a business. Organized mass media is a business which requires a lot of money, and uh, you know that money is there only with uh, you know the business houses. So, you know, just like elections, perhaps we should have publicly funded media. There have been attempts made in the digital space by a few. We'll see how it goes. Mr. Krishnamurti would like to have a word before he leaves. Sir, we would like to hear you. Yeah, I, entirely, I, entirely agree, I entirely agree with Mr. Srinivasan. I, I agree with Mr. Srinivasan. I think almost every political party has got an electronic media and a print media and so on. It's very unfortunate that the that the even the opinion polls that are flashed on the TV channels, they are all many of them are purchased, in my opinion. And in any case, this this kind of prejudiced media is not conducive to democracy. But generally, they say it is to be self-regulated. But with kind of the cable connections, fifty thousand cable connections in this country, I don't know what kind of regulation can be done. But I think some research needs to be done to see whether the media can be uh, at least regulated in terms of, in, at least in times of election. Can I, thank, can you, I thank, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can I make a comment? Yes, please. Yeah, just a quick comment. There is, uh, you know, apart from, I think Srinivasan has explained it very well in terms of the much larger set of choices we have today and the lower entry costs into various kinds of media. But what's, what, strikes me, and this is why you need a pari run by Sainath or you need something, a news click run by some people, is that the mainstream media, electronic or otherwise, hardly pays much attention to the problems of the mass of the population. Whether it is the farmer struggle, farmer struggle becomes news when they enter Mumbai, not otherwise. Or when they occupy uh, the outskirts of Delhi. But day to day, farmer suicides, for example, let me ask you, how long did it take before any English language newspaper would even report on farmer suicides. Whether they were reporting, you know, times or number on page three personalities. So, you know, I think that is the responsibility that the media itself has also exercised, apart from the vested interest of the owners, 
But I think that Srinivasan is correct in saying that today there is at least greater space for independent media and so on. Although, as you saw in the ED's uh, raid on news click, nothing is sacrosanct in this country. And the long arm of the law will be selectively applied to those the ruling regime doesn't like. Sir, all of you have been very, very patient and answering these questions. We are getting a lot of more questions, but I think we will close with just one last question. We all spoke about mismanagement by all the stakeholders, indiscipline by all the stakeholders. The question is, can e-governance and technology bring in transparency and restore balance in the system? What would you have to say on that, sir? Can I ask Mr. Deva Sahayam to yes. say? E-governance e and technology has already made the elections completely opaque and secret. <laughs> <laughs> Unless, see, in a democracy, let me tell you, I could not explain it earlier. See, we have, I have conducted elections during, uh, with the paper ballot. I have voted in electronic voting machines. See, there are three basic things. I am transferring technology, I must know. You can't just press a button in a machine and say that I have transferred my, my, transfer, uh, transferred my uh, kind of sovereignty. No. Technology, I, I recently uh, uh, read a book uh, uh, written by the president of the Microsoft. He says technology has almost killed democracy. I don't think there is any democracy will be left by the year 2050. And as the report of uh, uh, VDEM of Sweden and uh, Freedom Foundation of USA and the Economist uh, Index very clearly says, there has been ever since very sharp decline in democracy is taking place. It's inversely proportional to the advancement of um, te technology. So I am all for e-governance. I am all for e-governance. This technology playing, I'll, 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 there was, this matter came, issue of this EVM, EVM came simultaneously in Supreme Court of Germany and Supreme Court of India. I'll tell you the difference, how sharply we view things. Germany acknowledges the most technology advanced country in the world. And we are not, we are far away from them. There, when the technology argument was uh, put before the German Supreme Commission, just, just threw it out. Don't talk about technology as far as democracy is concerned. It must be, every voter must know whom he is voting for, whether it is being verified, counted, that is the norm as far as democracy is concerned, election is concerned. Whereas here, our Supreme Court said fit one more uh, one more machine. See, the, cost, the question is that technology has its place. But if you want to be a democracy, technology must be controlled and channeled. In my view, technology will be will will, will lead to the end of democracy. It maybe it may not may not be during my lifetime, but certainly in the near future. Dr. Samandam. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Surana. Um, I go along with uh, Mr. Teresa. I am as a techno pessimist on this line, but I would like to more sharply focus on the one part of the question regarding technology and administration with an anecdote. Uh, we all know that we have to pay taxes. Anybody who pays corporation taxes and applies for a house um, corporation tax assessment would know what he has to go through. Corporation of Madras has computerized it, and you have to get uh, you get a password. And what my uh, what the person who assessed my property said was that I repeat it in English. He said you'll get a you'll get a uh, you'll get an SMS. Don't click on it. Only tell me that you got the SMS. I smelled something, so I clicked on it, and he said pay so much, and I paid it. So if I had gone by what he had said, I was just given him told him that I got an SMS, then he would have told me what to pay, plus what is due to him. We, as a grouping, at the cost of stereotyping, with exceptions, but we are too, too clever by half. We always want a shortcut to various things. So I don't think it's really going to work. And before I round up, I just want to place on record my thanks to uh, three colleagues who helped me with this, putting my thoughts together. Dr. Garimala Subramaniam of the Hindu, uh, 
my former colleague in the Hindu, Dr. Vijay Bhaskar of MIDS and Dr. Srinivasan of um, Madras University, and Prof. Satri has always been an inspiration. Yes, Can I just have a word, uh, Dr. Sarada? Can I come in? Yes, please. Word? Yes. Yeah, just quickly. Yes, that, you know, technology is always a potential instrument of use. It can never be a fix for problems. You know, the obsession with technology fixes is the real issue. I'm all for using the two technologies that you're mentioning, but they cannot be substitutes for a democratic process. Now, the use of the word democracy in such non-class terms is a problem for me. There is democracy and democracy. We have a democracy in which there is enormous inequality of ownership of assets and access to productive employment opportunities. And you have an economy, you know, society which is hugely hierarchical in terms of caste, the caste system and caste operation. What kind of democracy is this? Why are we even talking about democracy without addressing fundamental issues like social inequality and caste operation, patriarchy and gender operation? I don't think that we should talk about democracy in the abstract. There is capitalist democracy. In India's case, there is capitalist democracy, which is happily compromised with pre-capitalist values or norms. That's just, that is the most serious threat to any genuine notion of democracy in this country. Also, the issue of digital divide, you know, because India is a country of huge digital, digital divides. So these benefits will automatically go to the digitally accessible and literate. So that is one more factor to be weighed in. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. We would like to keep listening to you. We have all this. We have lots of viewers coming in, lots of questions, but all good things have to come to an end. I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of our partner, lawyer, and the law firm Surana and Surana, profusely thank very, very distinguished panelists, Professor Venkatesh Atreya, Devasaha. I am Mr. K. C. Sundram, Mr. Srinivasan Raghavan, and of course, Mr. T. has just left for a prefixed meeting. Thank you very much. I believe this webinar has played an important role in making the younger generation think of various issues from a different perspective, from a different perspective of what they see in the media, what they hear in the media, what they read in the media. And I believe it will go a long way in strengthening the roots of democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.